Begin by making an incision in the simulated skin pad provided. We will now close this with interrupted sutures. Take a suture in your needle holder and insert the needle at right angles to the incision using counter pressure from the forceps. Pull the suture through gently without snagging it. Secure a standard reef knot, either using the one-handed technique or the instrument technique. Cut the suture to such a length as will allow it to be grasped for subsequent removal. As a rule of thumb, the distance from the edge of the wound should correspond to the thickness of the tissues being sutured. Each successive suture should be placed twice this distance apart, approximately double the depth of the tissue being sutured. Continue to insert your sutures in this manner across the entire wound. Now, let's insert another suture. When the incision edges are as closely aligned as these, it is appropriate to go through both edges with one smooth movement. But as will be demonstrated later, this is not always possible, and often the edges need to be taken separately. Once again, tie a reef knot. When inserting sutures, adopt a 1-2-3 technique. 1 2 3 once again, tie your knot, making sure that it lies correctly without any tension. Once the wound is closed, ensure that none of the knots lie over the suture line. There may be two types of wound you will be required to close. One, a linear wound, as you see here, the other, an elliptical wound. If you have to make an elliptical wound, try and ensure that the length of the ellipse is at least three times its width. When closing a linear wound, it may be easier to start in the middle of the wound, as you see here, inserting an interrupted suture and then ligating it. Remember, with these simulated pads, the tissue is often very springy, more so than normal skin. Make allowance for this during your exercises. Once the initial suture has been placed, it is then easy to halve the remainder of the incision each side to continue to close it. Therefore, insert one suture halfway along the remainder of one end of the incision and ligate this. Then, having completed that suture, again halve the remaining wound and continue as shown. It may not be possible to do this for an elliptical incision, and you may need to undermine the incision edges to increase mobility of the skin edge. In this situation, it is not practical to start in the middle of the wound as such a suture will be under too much tension and therefore inaccurate. Thus, in this situation, start at the end of the incision, inserting a suture at right angles and getting right down into the depths of the incision, and then come back at the other edge of the skin, again at right angles to the skin edge, and ligate that particular suture. You can then proceed to the other end of the incision and, in a similar manner, insert the suture at right angles into the depth of the wound and then out again at right angles onto the other edge of the incision and tie a standard reef knot. You are now in a position to continue to close this ellipse, working from each end alternately, inserting interrupted sutures like this. This makes for a most satisfactory closure.
We are now going to close the same incision using a continuous suture technique. Insert the first suture as before at right angles to the skin edge and ligate this using a standard reef knot. However, in this situation, just cut the short end and hand the long end of the suture to your assistant, who will follow you during this procedure. The second suture is put in in a standard manner as before, and then the suture snugged down and handed to your assistant. Here comes the third suture, the distance apart being exactly the same as for interrupted sutures. Work along the wound each time ensuring the same tension, and then hand it to your assistant who maintains that tension. Work along the wound ensuring equal distance between the sutures to ensure the same tension down the whole length of the incision. After the final suture has been inserted, leave one loop long and then ligate using a standard reef knot technique. Once this has been tied, you're in a position to cut both ends of the suture material. We will now demonstrate the essential role of the assistant in the insertion of a continuous suture. Start once again by inserting the initial suture and ligating this using the reef knot technique. In this situation, let us assume that we wish to maintain a hold of the end of the short suture as a stay. In this case, get your assistant to place a hemostat on the end of the suture, grasping it right at the tip of the jaws, not up near the hinge where it would slip. Grasp it in the tip of the jaws and place to one side. Then pass the other length of the suture to your assistant and make sure that they hold it the right distance from the wound. Not too close, and not too far away. Then continue suturing. As you insert the suture and pull it through gently, your assistant should release the suture and allow you to snug it down. Pass it again to the assistant. As one continues along the incision, it is important that the suture material does not get caught around instruments, as you see here and your assistant should remain alert to such a danger. Unfortunately, in this case, the assistant was not alert and allowed the suture material to twist around an instrument. It now becomes increasingly difficult to untwist this and panic sets in. The assistant then starts to put their hand into the middle of the surgeon's view, which is even worse, but eventually the suture material is freed. Pass it again to your assistant, who will be wary for the rest of the operation. When cutting sutures, do not cut them too long, as this long length of thread will be a needless waste of suture material, and will get caught up in the wound or in the dressings. However, don't cut them too short, otherwise this will be insecure and might even lead to the unravelling of the knot. Cut the suture to such a length that it will be secure and also allow the suture to be grasped during its subsequent removal. Mattress sutures can be inserted to allow for eversion or inversion. They can also be used for irregular skin edges. We will demonstrate here a vertical mattress suture. The suture is put in, as you see, in the standard manner. The needle is reversed, and then, taking just a small bite of the skin edges, the suture is completed 
and a reef knot tied. A second vertical mattress suture is inserted. The suture is placed. The needle then reversed in the needle holder and then go back, taking just a few millimeters of skin edges. The knot is then tied and the suture material cut. Let's insert just one more vertical mattress suture. In at right angles. Reverse the needle. And then going back. Just taking the wound edges as seen. We will now demonstrate the horizontal mattress suture. The initial suture is as before. Again, reverse the needle in the needle holder, but on this occasion move slightly horizontally and go back to the other side of the incision in a similar manner. One can see very clearly why this is called a horizontal mattress suture. Once again, the reef knot is tied in the standard manner and the suture material cut. We will now insert another horizontal mattress suture. The suture is inserted in the standard manner. The needle reversed and then returned to the opposite side of the wound, parallel to the initial traverse. The suture is then secured with a reef knot. Both vertical and horizontal mattress sutures can be useful for ensuring eversion or inversion of wound edges, and this is clearly demonstrated by diagrams in your handbook. The difference between the vertical mattress suture and the horizontal mattress suture can easily be seen in this demonstration. Start the subcuticular suture by inserting a knot at the far end of the incision. Tie a standard reef knot and then cut the short end of the suture very short as we're going to bury the knot. Then, using the forceps, carefully retract the skin edge. Take a small bite of the subcuticular material and pull the suture through. Then, on the opposite side of the wound, insert a similar subcuticular bite of the suture material and gently work up the wound, ensuring that each bite does not go too deep into the tissues. Each new suture must be inserted almost opposite the exit of the previous suture, and this ensures that as the suture material is tightened, it draws the wound edges together, almost in the manner of invisible mending. The accuracy of the placement of the sutures will ensure an equal tension down the wound and neatness of the closure. You can see here a needle going in just at the skin edge, taking a bite of the subcuticular tissues and coming out at the skin edge.
At the end of the incision, the needle can be exited about a centimeter away from the edge, and then the needle reversed and passed back almost through the same hole in the skin in the opposite direction. This can be repeated, passing the needle through the same skin hole, back again, and then cut. For non-absorbable sutures, some surgeons like to use the collar and cuff technique. There is a crushed bead at one end, followed by a larger bead to stop the suture being pulled through the needle hole. Once the closure has been completed, a further bead and cuff are placed onto the suture end, and once the correct tension has been applied to the suture material, the metal bead is crushed using a substantial hemostat or bead crusher. And then the suture is cut.